Coming to you from the city of dreams. A TV host of more than 60 infomercials and $1 billion in sales gives inventors, authors, and entrepreneurs the chance to make their dreams come true by finding out, is your product ready to be seen on TV? This is The Pitch with Tom Jordan. Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Pitch. I'm Tom Jordan. This is the show where inventors, authors, and entrepreneurs come on to pitch their products to marketers and investors who are looking for products to put on TV and take to retail. We are coming to you from UBN at Sunset Gower Studios, and this is going to be a huge show today. I've got some great guests. I've got great products. So there's going to be no shenanigans today. We're going to get right into it. Let's do it right now. I have three amazing products. A kid's product that will blow you away, and there's nothing out there like it. It's a guaranteed hit. A multifunctional item that lifts, carries, and stores. And a very innovative product for walkers and runners, and it's something that I definitely want. Plus, I have two phenomenal guests coming on the show today. You know, I know people in very high places, and I have the mayor of Nashville coming on. No, not the mayor of Nashville, but the mayor of Nashville, the hit ABC TV show. That's right, my good friend and star of the ABC series Nashville, who was also in the hit film American Sniper, Eric Close is going to Skype in today. And another super nice guy is on the show today because the owner and director of Syncbox Media, a very successful direct response company, is coming in at the end of the show. Bruce Summers is here, and maybe you can figure out who he's related to that is loved by everybody on this planet. Now, if any marketers or investors see a product on today's episode or any of my past episodes that you're interested in, just email me at tom at thepitchwithtom.com, and I'll get you connected with those inventors. And if you want information about the show in general, just go to my website, thepitchwithtom.com. Let's get to our first pitch. Kids' products can be a gold mine, but many of them are for a very narrow target age range, and it kind of limits the market. Are you ready to fall in love with a product that you wish you had when you were a kid? This is a product that's perfect for toddlers, up to teenagers, up to all kinds of ages, and I was shocked to find out that there's nothing else like it out there because their patent is ironclad. Here comes a hit product. Flo and Claire Donovan are mother-daughter swim instructors from New Orleans who volunteered to teach individuals with special needs how to swim. They wanted to raise money for JoJo's Hope, a nonprofit swim program that teaches children and adults with special needs. They came up with an idea to help get non-swimmers excited about going in the water, and it's become an immediate sensation. Introducing Flow Glows, the world's first glow-in-the-dark swim goggles. Yep, glow-in-the-dark swim goggles. I mean, what kid wouldn't want these? And the only way to get it is by getting a Flow Glow, because these are the only swim goggles that glow. Kids can transition from fun in the sun to cool night swimming, because the fun doesn't have to end just because the sun goes down. Made from glow-in-the-dark silicone, these goggles charge by any light source for hours of glowing fun. In fact, you can just stick it in front of the pool light for like 10 or 20, maybe 30 seconds to get it charged. Any light source will charge it, and it doesn't have to be pitch black for it to glow. Just go in the shade or dim light, and you'll be glowing. When flow glows are fully charged, they'll glow for up to 12 hours. Kids love them at water parks, hotel pools, cruise ships, the beach, or any place with a pool. Just wear them outside, and then you can even come into the house, and you'll still be glowing. But it's not just for pools. Do you have trouble getting your little ones to get into the bath? Not anymore, because just turn down the lights or turn it off, and they will be begging to go in there to get clean when they're wearing their Flow Glows. It changes bath time into fun time. Flow Glows are available in two sizes, child and teen adult, and are easily adjustable to provide a comfort fit for the whole family, from toddlers to big kids like me. Choose from six fun colors. They provide 100% UV protection with anti-fog polycarbonate lenses, and they are latex-free. Flow Glows are leak-resistant with double-thin soft silicone no-slip straps, and they fit the contours of your face for a comfortable fit. And these are very high-quality goggles, which is why swim teams are even using them. Flow Glows don't leak. Flow Glows have very comprehensive design and utility patents, which is why you won't find another product out there like it. 
In fact, the design patent covers the front of the goggles to glow, and the utility patent gives Flow Glow the full range of glow-in-the-dark capability, so no one else can get into this market with a goggle that will actually glow. The current cost of goods is around $4, but that's at low volumes, and it's retailing for $19.99, but with higher volumes, those margins get even better. $10,000 of Flow Glows have already been sold on the web and through some retail stores in the New Orleans area, and there are 4,000 units in inventory. There are upsells in development that are unique and will be another huge hit and they're a perfect fit for the flow glows, but I can't tell you about them unless you're interested in pursuing a deal. The sky is the limit with this product. Every kid that would see it in a commercial would want it, and probably in every color. Plus, every water park, resort, cruise ship, catalog, or retail shop that sells summer or kids' products would jump on this. And if you're interested, you'll also be helping others because Flow Glows donates a portion of their proceeds to individuals with special needs. This is a major winner with endless upside. If you want to jump in, just email me at tom at thepitchwithtom.com and I'll get you connected with Flow and Claire. Don't miss your chance to charge and go with Flow Glows. And when we come back, we're going to be talking to TV and film star Eric Close, so don't go anywhere. If you're an inventor and want to find out about appearing on The Pitch, go to thepitchwithtom.com and click on the red inventor button. Marketers looking for more information should click on the blue marketer button. And you can also learn more about me and my work as a host and producer at the same website or by visiting tomjordan.com. If you're a marketer or investor and you see a product you're interested in on today's show and you want to talk to the inventor or if you want to contact me for any reason, you can email me at tom at thepitchwithtom.com. This is The Pitch with Tom Jordan. Welcome back to The Pitch. Sometimes it's good to mix things up, so I thought it would be fun to have a celebrity join us on The Pitch, so I called in a favor. Eric Close is a very successful film and TV actor and director currently playing Mayor Teddy Conrad on ABC's hit series Nashville. You can also see Eric in Clint Eastwood's hit film American Sniper. He starred for seven years on CBS's Without a Trace and has been in countless TV series and films. And he's coming to us from Nashville. I am thrilled to welcome my good friend, Eric Close. Eric, how's it going, buddy? Great, Tom. How are you? Oh, I'm doing good. You know, it's funny because we know how long we've known each other, right? You know why we know that. Yes, yes. <laughs> Our daughters go to school together. We have two of a kind that have been together since kindergarten and they're in eighth grade. So we've known each other nine years, Eric. I know. Isn't it amazing how quickly the time flies by, too? But listen, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I know this is your day off from Nashville, ABC, season yep. three. We're at Wednesday nights. We're at 10 o'clock, uh, primetime, uh, central, 9 o'clock. And uh, we are in season three, and we're starting to close in on the end of the season. Okay, so for those crazy people out there that have not caught Nashville and don't know about you and your character... Tell them a little bit about the role you play on the show and a little bit about the show, too. Yeah. Uh, well, so I play the mayor of Nashville. I play Mayor Teddy Conrad. In the first season, I was married to Raina James, who was played by the incredibly talented Connie Britton. Mm -hmm. And then through, uh, I don't want to give too much away, but throughout the series, we parted ways, but we have two daughters together. He's a... Uh, very complicated person and mayor, <laughs> put it yeah. that way. Yeah, you have a lot of problems going on. I watch every episode, and, and you're doing a great job. You know, people watching don't really get a chance to find out from a true working actor like yourself, not one who is waiting tables, but, I mean, a real actor, what it's like on a daily basis when you're working. Can you give us a sense of a typical work day, what happens? Well, you know, for me, I think one thing that people don't realize often, unless they come and hang out on a set for a while, they don't realize how much time you spend uh, putting a scene together. Um, you know, you're you're watching, let's say, 42 minutes on a primetime network show. Uh, every day we shoot approximately anywhere from 12 to 15 hours, and that equates to about eight minutes of screen time. So there is a lot of time and effort and a large group of people, you know, anywhere from 200 to 300 people working all day long to, you know, make eight, eight minutes uh, of television time. So that's one thing I would say. And uh, the other thing I would say, I, I have an absolute blast. I look forward to going to work. I love my job. It's different every day. Uh, I'm working with a great group of people, a very eclectic group of people, and uh, that makes it a lot of fun. You're, you're married to, or kind of were married to Connie Britton. I actually took her away to the Looney Tune place 
on uh, American Horror Story. So we have a little bit in connection there. She's a very right. sweet woman. <laughs> yeah, great she lady. Is, she's incredibly sweet, you know, and yeah. uh, we're yeah, we're both fortunate to have worked with her. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, the show runs for a while and I get to continue to work with her. Absolutely. Now, now you also direct and I know you directed uh, episodes for Nashville and also Without a Trace. What's right. that like and how does that compare to the acting for you? Well, in my case, uh, directing, I also was acting in the episode. So uh, kind of a mini version of what Clint Eastwood would do, <laughs> um, you know, his on a much grander scale. But as a director, really what you're doing is you're, you're expressing your vision on that script. You're taking what the writers have created and their vision, and then you bring your ideas to it. And then you sort of tell everybody, hey, this is what I'm thinking of doing, whether it's the actors, the crew, whoever. And it's so much fun to watch everybody come together to make that vision happen. And, and there's no issues with an actor that you're typically acting with. And, and quite often, actors don't like to get notes from fellow actors, you know, directorial notes. And now you're directing them, and you're, you, I assume, are giving them directorial notes. No issues there? No, I mean, the biggest... The, the, Tell the truth, Eric. The biggest diva <laughs> probably is myself. <laughs> I don't like giving myself notes because I really, you know, we, we kind of go back and forth at each other. <laughs> I don't know if you recall when you first came on my radar, because I had this conversation with you early on. Do you remember what show it was that I told you I first discovered you when I first knew who Eric Close is? Sparks, guys. No, no. What it was is I had just moved to L.A., you know, was trying to be an actor, and I turn on this show, and it's like, oh, my gosh, this guy is doing a part that I would love to do. I want to be him, and it was the show uh, Now and Again, right? Yes. John, John Goodman got hit by, what, a subway yes. car or something, and you were the perfect specimen guy, like the bionic man type of thing. Yeah, they put John Goodman's brain in my body, and <laughs> right. I was a $3 billion man built by the government. You were really cut. Too, I mean, right? Were you in yeah, great was, shape? I, yeah, I was ripped up. I, you know, it sort of depresses me because I look at those pictures sometimes and go, oh, I got to get back there. How am I going to do it? I'm getting older. Well, I've got the picture on the screen right now when you were ripped, so just, you can relive it when you watch this. For a second, let's talk about Without a Trace because you did seven seasons. I mean, this is a guy that has gone from series to series. What was that experience like? It was definitely a big game changer as far as a career goes. I went from a lot of you know, one season on a show and then one and out. And when that show took off, it was just kind of the perfect storm and in a good way. Being involved with Jerry Bruckheimer, we had a, a great time. It was close to home. So, you know, I could pop over from Warner Brothers to our kids' school and see the kids. So I was definitely, a, you know, I was able to be a hands-on dad and all that with, during that time. And it was just all across the board great. And that was where I got to make my directorial debut on that show. You know, I'd been wanting to do that for years. Let's segue to the most recent, to me, one of the most exciting things. You're in American Sniper, worked with Clint Eastwood, Bradley Cooper. What was that like? You know, Tom, that was, uh, that was a dream come true. Um, I've, I've, I've been a huge fan of Clint Eastwood since I was a kid. I'm a cowboy at heart anyway. Over the years, we've gotten to know Clint a little bit through the Pebble Beach AT&T golf tournament, the mm -hmm. Pro-Am, because mm -hmm. I've played in that, and the year was my eighth year playing in that, and Clint, um, Mr. Eastwood, is the uh, chairman and host of that tournament. So I got to know him over the years, and we played some golf together, and never thought I'd ever get a chance to work with him. I never brought it up. You know, I just didn't feel it was uh, professional, but you know, this movie came along, and we had just had dinner together a few months prior to that. And, um, you know, it just, I think it just all kind of came together and I put myself on tape on my, I literally put myself on tape on a little cell phone. Wow. Sent, you know, on my iPhone and sent in a, a tape. And the next thing I know, I'm on my way to Morocco, uh, to work with not only Clint Eastwood, but Bradley Cooper, right. Lucas Grimes and all those guys and an incredible, I mean, it was just an experience I can't even tell you. It was everything they said about working with Clint. I mean, he moves quickly, but he's very, he's decisive. He knows exactly what he wants to do. He trusts you as an actor. And uh, that was very rewarding. And working with a three-time Oscar nominee, Bradley, who's amazingly talented. And then working with Clint, who's won a few Oscars himself. Yeah. Well, you nailed it. You were perfect in the part, and, and I was thrilled to see you on there. Congratulations. I was, I was just proud, Tom, to be a part of that, yeah. that movie. I think it was a very important film. Yeah. Okay, Eric, I do have to ask you a question related to what this show that I'm doing is about, because the pitch is about bringing inventors on, presenting products to marketers, looking for products. So I would be remiss if I didn't ask you one infomercial-related question, okay? So are you ready to handle that? 
We'll see. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of celebrities that host and are celebrity testimonials and infomercials. And I know actors are at different stages of their career, and there's a lot of variables there. But you've seen that, I'm sure, people doing that that are huge stars. Is that something that you would ever consider? And what are your thoughts on it? Sure. I mean, uh, the one thing I've noticed, especially in the last several years, uh, is exactly what you talked about. If you're passionate about something, if it's a product and you want to put your name to it or your voice to it, why not? I mean, I, and obviously you get paid to do it. And that's a good thing. Well, he's not going to be cheap. I'm just letting you know, but he's going to be good. Okay, Eric. So Take here we go. <laughs> right. Okay. I, these are quick questions I'm about to ask you. All right. And these are the real questions because I've been giving you the softball questions. Oh boy. Here we go. Ready? Because these questions are coming from Twitter. Okay, you ready for this? Yeah. These are not from me, Eric. These are from Twitter. All right. All right. So here's one that's they're asking. I saw you in People Magazine. You were one of the sexiest guys, they said. Did your wife agree, and did that help you in any way? I think she probably agreed, but I don't think it helped me in any way, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you kiss a lot of ladies on Nashville. Does it gross out your daughters? No, they, they just... They think it's funny. They kind of laugh at me, they, you know. Okay, uh, last Twitter question. When will you sing on the show? Aren't you making your debut right here on the pitch with your singing voice, Eric? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I, uh, you know what? Look, I, um, I love to sing in the shower, mm. in the car. Uh -huh. uh, I haven't done it professionally. I actually uh, started playing the guitar a few months ago. I've been really enjoying I've owned guitars my whole life, but never really given myself the time to sit down and and put some time into learning it, and I have been. And so you never know. This show runs mm -hmm. long enough, and I get some voice lessons. Maybe I can get up there and make my Opry debut. Well, here, here's one thing I, I just want to say about Eric. Uh, you know, people have perceptions of actors and that they're snobby and all that. But I, I can tell you, Eric Close is one of the nicest guys out there, and he'll talk to anybody. He has no attitude, no ego. And I know he's very supportive because he was stuck with me and a golf foursome for our school. It was a charity event. And I'm not a golfer, but it was still my worst day. And he watched me slice ball after ball, and he was never anything but kind. So I appreciate that, Eric, very much. Well, you know what? The same thing has happened to me many times. <laughs> you would see me at Pebble Beach this year. You would you would feel my pain. Really? Because I, I thought you did great this year. That didn't uh, happen. You know what? The, the great thing about uh, – Pebble Beach is they only show the good shots. I know that from coming to your house many times for just wonderful charity events that you have a very philanthropic family. And I wanted you to have a chance to talk a little bit about what charity you're involved in and how people can participate. Well, uh, speaking of, you know, get, gathering at our, our home, we have um, over the last several years have had some uh, opportunity to, to be involved with Africa Foundation. And if you want to know more about them, you can go to africafoundation.org. They range from medical clinics to schools. It's a really great program. They work with the communities they hire within the community. That's exciting to me, uh, giving people an opportunity. It's helping them, you know, helping kids out with, you know, health issues. People get fresh water across the board. It's a great organization. I'm, you know, proud to be a part of it. And I have to say, it's not just Carrie and I. It's all of our friends, including you. Um, and Claudia and everybody who have supported us. I mean, you know, we're philanthropic, but I think all everybody who's been involved, all of our friends are philanthropic too, and we all come together. And again, it's that group effort to make these kind of things happen. Well, thank so, you for that. Yeah, you're, you're, you're a great family. You've done a great job, and I wish you continued success. And I really do appreciate you taking time out to talk with me here. This is a lot of fun. I, I agree. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate it you having me on. Absolutely. And we will be right back with our next pitch right after this. To learn how to appear on The Pitch, log on to thepitchwithtom.com. This is The Pitch with Tom Jordan. Welcome back to The Pitch. Are you ever alone and you need to lift or move something that's heavy or bulky, but there's no one around to help you? Maybe you want to carry some things up to the attic or you got a bunch of groceries in the car that you need to bring in and you don't want to make a million trips. And you have things around the house that need to be stored and put away, but you don't have space for it, and you hate looking at all the clutter. Sue Stark, a licensed interior decorator, loves to solve problems like this, and she has invented a multi-purpose utility hook with limitless possibilities. It's called the Snagit. The Snagit is a true multifunction item that can be used to either organize or carry objects. Now you can carry or move heavy things by yourself, 
and even group things together and throw it over your shoulder to avoid multiple trips. You can drag, snag, lift, pull, or even organize your closet or dorm room. It's a real space saver. The Snagit is made from durable composite material and has a hook at each end as well as eight slots that could be used for additional hooks. It comes in red or blue, is very lightweight, and it can hold or move well over 50 pounds, and it's very flexible both literally and figuratively because it has unlimited uses, including securing items in your car, garage, or closet, allowing you to save space and store large bulky things out of the way. Now you can maximize small places such as dorm rooms or your wood shop to hang tools, your kitchen to hang pots and pans, or your closet to hang clothes or scarves. It's really endless. You can either add additional hooks in the eight holes to hang additional items or use the slots themselves in various ways. The Snagit has a U.S. patent and 10,000 units in inventory. The cost on that initial order was $2 per item, but with higher volumes, that cost will come down even further. There's nothing like it out there. The closest thing are poles that extend the reach, but nothing that's lightweight, flexible, and with hooks on both ends along with additional slots for more uses. There are plenty of bonus options in addition to the hooks, such as notepads or small bulletin boards to put on the top, or stickers or jewels because kids love to decorate it for the room. Very demonstrable for TV and great for retail because it takes up very little space and you can hang it from a rack in the store. I love that it's equally great for lifting and carrying as well as storing things out of the way. And if you're interested in the Snagit, just email me at tom at thepitchwithtom.com and I will get you connected with Sue to talk about it. We'll be right back with our next pitch right after this. To learn more about The Pitch, log on to thepitchwithtom.com. This is The Pitch with Tom Jordan. Welcome back to The Pitch. Let me introduce our next inventor. John Hobbs has been in the fitness industry for over 15 years and lost over 100 pounds and is now a marathon runner. His revolutionary new product is the APG Balanced Water Bottle System, which is a game changer for walkers and runners, and he's coming to us from Tampa, Florida. Hey, John, how you doing? I'm doing great, Tom. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. It's great to see you. So tell me, what problem are you solving, and how did you come up with the idea? The problem I'm solving is hydration for people that run or walk for fitness. How I came up with the idea is I used to live on Marco Island, and I ran the beach every day. So I'd go to the beach, I'd run seven miles. By the time I got home, I found myself, I was always hitting the wall, cramping, and could never really do more than seven miles. One day I just happened to have the opportunity to drink several times during my run, and I did. That day I ran five extra miles and still didn't have any issues. So I then went out and started buying every product on the market to see if there was anything that would solve my needs. There was nothing that did not hurt my rhythm, gait, or stride. So one day I was running running home and it popped into my head the full design for my product. Okay, so tell us about your product and how it solves the problem. What I did is I developed a bottle that envelops your hand so you really don't have to hold it. It just rests in your hand. When you get thirsty, there's a trigger. You hit the trigger, a valve opens in the bottle, and you can drink. It's that simple, that easy. So you just drink as you're running along? Because I'm a runner. I never have water with me. I always wait till I'm home until I have a drink. So you're saying it's important to stay hydrated while you're running. Yes. The average runner starts becoming dehydrated in 15 minutes in warmer climates, but does not feel the effects for 45 And if you stay properly hydrated while running, you can increase your distance faster, you feel better during and after your workout, you recover quicker while losing weight and and feeling all around better. John, how much fluid can it hold and does it make it heavy to carry? In this design here, it looks like it hardly holds anything, but it actually holds 15 ounces. So the bottle weighs 19 ounces full and four ounces empty, so it never becomes a burden to use. They're sold and used in pairs, so they encourage proper form and balance while running. They're the only hydration system that encourages proper form and balance, so you build a better body while working out. So you've got one in each hand. Obviously, that's part of the balance aspect. Now, are they comfortable to carry? Very comfortable. They just rest in the hand. They rest on top of the hand, virtually no effort to hold. And John, is there anything else that's unique about the system that you've developed? Yes. The system's designed 
to add weights. Ah. So you can add stackable weights. So when you're cruising along, if you want to build your arms and shoulders a little bit more and burn a few extra calories in the same amount of time you're doing your regular run or walk, is something simple and easy to do. Also, there's an optional strap for those people that choose it. It just wraps around the hand, and now if you, you choose to use the optional strap, now it's really in your hand. It just little no effort. You forget they're there. They're so comfortable. So either you're holding it or you've got the strap. That's an option for you. I love the stackable weights. That's just a great idea. I also know you have an optional safety flashlight feature that can be snapped in, which is so helpful. But let me ask you this. How does it compare? Because I know there's a lot of water bottle systems out there. What makes yours different besides what you've already mentioned? Imagine carrying one bottle in a hand. You have to grip it. It tightens muscles all the way in your shoulders, throws off your rhythm gait hurts your rhythm and stride, can cause injury. The belt or backpack systems trap in a lot of heat. They're cumbersome to get to, and they become rancid if you don't clean them. How is that different than cleaning yours? Well, mine's designed with a very large opening. So you just open it up and throw it in the dishwasher, and it's done. Nice and easy to clean. I can see where that would make a difference, having that large opening. Now, John, are there other potential upsells that would go along with this in addition to the optional weights and the flashlight attachment? Yeah, we're going to have a clothing line. So when you have the bottles and a clothing line, you create a look, which is very stylish. It's something women are definitely going to want to do. And we also have an electrolyte, which is one of the best on the market. And it's perfect for our continuity program. Absolutely. Great continuity. So what stage is your product in right now, John? It's completely engineered and ready for tooling. And do you have a patent? Yes, we have an issued patent. Okay. And what do you suggest the selling price to be based on your experience and research? Thirty-four ninety-five a pair and with a map price and a minimum advertised pricing of twenty nine ninety five. John, explain where you currently are with your business plan and what is it that you're seeking help with? Well, we've already raised quite a bit of capital and we ha have the whole back end ready, for the complete distribution ready of the product. So what we're looking for is we're looking for product partners that can do meet the media campaign for us and also investors. As I mentioned, I love to run, but I hate having things around my waist. I hate feeling off balance and to be able to have a product to where I can stay hydrated as I'm running, which I've never been able to do, and also to be able to increase my workout with the attachable weights. In addition, I never run at night because I don't want to carry a flashlight. So for that to be built in and to have both of these like appendages in my hands to me just makes total sense. I know I want one. I hope you're going to be sending me one. And I really appreciate you coming on the show, John. Well, I appreciate you for having me, Tom, and of course, I'll be sending you a set. <laughs> Sounds great. Now, if you want to get in touch with John about the APG Balanced Water Bottle System, just email me at tom at thepitchwithtom.com, and I will get you connected. When we come back, we have a guest who is an expert in the direct response world, and his mom has actually done pretty well for herself, too. Don't go anywhere. To contact an inventor from today's episode, or if you have any questions, email tom at thepitchwithtom.com. This is The Pitch with Tom Jordan. Welcome back to The Pitch. I am honored to introduce you to my next guest. Bruce Summers has been directing and producing DRTV campaigns since 1991. In 1999, he founded Syncbox Media to combine his filmmaking skills with the creative process of branded direct response TV and has generated more than $3 billion of revenue for some of the biggest companies in the world. He's also the son of possibly the most beloved, iconic actress and direct response spokesperson in history, and we'll hear more about that. And here he is, Bruce Summers is here on the pitch. Good to see you, buddy. Nice to see you. Oh, this is great to have you sitting there. Now, you know, usually I start by establishing how we met and how we know each other, but this is a little different. Because I actually met your mom, and for those idiots who haven't figured it out, Suzanne Summers, <laughs> before I met you. Do you recall that? I don't. I, I, no, I don't. Really? I'm sure I shared that with you 25 times. At some point, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I met your... And you're the first person that shared that with me. No, <laughs> you know, every actor in town has probably worked with your mom over the years because she's At worked so point, long, exactly. right? Exactly. Uh, step by step. 
Oh, right. She was the mom in right. the family. Yes. I was some car salesman. I mean, it was like a nothing thing. But here's what I remember. She was so sweet. And I was trying to think of things to talk to her about. And we're sitting in the makeup room and we're talking about your sister's jeans. Oh, right. 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 I mean, right. jeans, not, not, right. not, right. Exactly. <laughs> Blue not, jeans. Not genetics. Not genetics. <laughs> because she was making embroidering. It, and she sent, she made two pairs that she sent to uh, uh, Madonna and Sandra Bernhardt. Wow. And those two uh, were partying together or something and, and came out of a club wearing them. And it turned into a million dollar business for her. You're kidding. Yeah. Painted jeans. Painted. That's what it was. Yeah. I was acting like I was yeah. going to buy some. But I just wanted to talk to your mom. Exactly. <laughs> she was very sweet. Yeah. You would have been very progressive had they had you worn them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was in the right town. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Okay. So then let's go forward. Yes. Because we met because I was hired to right. host a couple of shows right. for you. And the first one, do you remember? Floormate. Yes, Hoover. Yes. Hoover Floormate. Floormate. Yes. Yeah. Do you remember which week it was? Do you remember when it was? Uh, I would say it's been, you mean how many years ago? Uh, well, no, but been, there was an no, event. No, I don't remember. There, there was an event that happened. We uh, worked the week of 9 11. Oh, my goodness. That shoot almost got canceled. And what I don't think you or I knew until we left the, the uh, lot that day right. is that we were on lockdown. I, they weren't going to let us out if we wrapped early, which we never do. Right. No worries there. <laughs> exactly. I don't remember that. Yeah. And then the other job we did together, I, I assume nothing happened that week. We did a, do you remember it was a Epson? Yeah, Epson that's Brothers. right. That's right. Yeah. So we worked a yeah. couple times yeah, exactly. together. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I have to say, as a director, you remind me of somebody. And you'll never guess who. Okay. Okay. But Phil Jackson. Oh. And, and I'll tell you why. Okay. You have this Zen quality. I don't know if you're reading your mom's books or what's going on, but I'm serious. On the set, this guy, you know, we're stressful actors. And I look over, and the smile you see now, it's the same smile. He's laid back. Everything's fine. Are you always that way? Uh, not always, but on the set, there's something interesting that happens because, I, first off, I feel so lucky mm -hmm. that we get to do that for a living. Mm -hmm. And I work 95% of the time for the 5% of production because that's the fun part. Right. And the other thing is there are all these the clients and producers and people that I hire or people that I work for that are usually very worried about, are we going to make our day? Are we going to get all the footage? And the reality is, is it always works out. It always does. And um, part of that is because I know where, if, if we are running behind, I know where we can cut and get to the end. Right. But um, there's a comfort factor of like, we're not curing cancer here, so let's have fun. And, <laughs> and, and I do think that I'm setting the tone. I, yes. do, I do think that that's important. Yes. And I like, th there could be a shit storm behind the, the set, but if the talent on set feels any of the anxiety of anyone else, yep. it's gonna be reflected in the energy. And okay. So I have a responsibility. Directors, well. be listening to that because what I usually see is this exactly. happening back here exactly. and it doesn't make you feel great. Yeah. All right. So here, here's what I want to ask you about because to me and I think to most people in the country that think, okay, Bruce Summers, Suzanne Summers' son, I mean, to people, they're going to think this kid grew up like TV, Hollywood royalty. <laughs> He's going to be spoon. messed up. There's no way this guy is going to come out of this normal. How can it be that you are, and I mean this, like one of the most down-to-earth, normal people, sharp too, coming out of an iconic, like Chrissy was your mom. How does that happen? Well, you know, when you get out of rehab, yeah, there's a... <laughs> <laughs> is that the truth? <laughs> I, I think that I was lucky in that um, I wasn't born into it. Uh, uh, when we, when I was young, uh, um, and I say we because she's only 19 years older than I am. Oh. Uh, um, is that true or are you just making her feel good? No, that's true. That's true. She, <laughs> she looks like she is. She's sure. terrible at math and always yeah. tried to shave two years off. And now every, she's 68 and you yeah. know she's on Dancing with the Stars now. Yeah, I know. And uh, I'm very proud of her. Yes. But she also just like, if that's what 68 looks like for a smidgen of people, that's something to shoot for. Cause right. But um, the reality is, is when I was a kid, we were poor. And there were a couple nights where I'd look down and it's like, I guess we're having a baked potato for dinner. And it's when you're poor, you don't feel like you're poor. You just know that other people have a lot more stuff, mm -hmm. but you don't feel uh, less than. Uh, um, and I think that those uh, were grounding years. When, it, when Three's Company hit. Uh, how, how old were you then? I was 11. 
Okay. And uh, um, very quickly, my mother realized, okay, this is a chaotic town, and and uh, little did we know that um, I was in the same age bracket as uh, um, uh, Emilio Estevez mm-hmm. and Charlie Sheen, mm-hmm. and I probably would have been running around with them because yeah. I, I would seek that kind of energy. Uh-huh. But I went to boarding school, and she said, try it for two weeks. If you don't like it, come home. Oh, okay. And I got up there, and I loved it. So it was you, like you were away from it then for I was kind of protected from the craziness. From, yeah. Not and that's not to say that I didn't make some mistakes. I didn't yeah. sort of let some of it get to my head at a certain point. Yeah. But I think it was, you know, it, it was this uh, needle that had had to rewrite itself. Right. But um we're all pretty damn lucky. So that's for that's you to make it out of that, I mean, because <laughs> that's amazing. So and I know that you're very important to her for a lot of reasons, obviously. You're you're the son, but uh you're also her gadget guy. Is that true? Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I happen to have my very own gadget guy. And he makes house calls because he just happens to be my son, Bruce Summers. <laughs> hey, Ma. <laughs> In fact, she just she just emailed me something like, how do I? Uh-huh. And I'm always, Mom, I, I actually have to do work for a living. <laughs> so I, I, I sometimes I'll just log into her computer and fix stuff. Right. And then log out and she doesn't. She's like, it just fixed itself. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so was, was having her as a mom in the TV business, was that, did that influence what you wanted to do? How did you? You get into TV and film and all that? I don't think I knew that there were other things. Hmm. And I started out as an actor. And uh, um, I remember I was I was up at UC Berkeley acting. I mean, not that that's where you go for acting, but mm-hmm. I was a dr- dramatic arts major and uh, my heart was set on it and I was hell bent. And one day I realized I'm not that good. <laughs> and for about three or four months, I was uh, trying to figure out like, well, what do I do now? And I took a directing class and everything everything found a place. Mm. I realized sort of like uh, Walter Alston or Tommy Lasorda. You know, well, Tommy was a good baseball player, but people who are bad baseball players and good managers. Yep, yep. I realized, OK, I needed to learn the vernacular mm-hmm. uh, um, and learn the, you know some of the techniques so that I could communicate. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I'd probably be OK now because I don't need it. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, but uh, I was not good then. I was. I, was <laughs> I can <my> relate. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there many times. So, so how did the path of direct response? Because you're into TV and film, and then your mom is going from TV to direct response. How, how did all that converge, or, or did it? It did actually. The interesting thing is, um, uh, Thighmaster was her first big thing and that was huge and huge in every way exactly yeah. and now there's the thigh master vibrato so it's like starting a new wave uh-huh. but the um that kind of revitalized her career or at least sent her in a different trajectory because that was between uh three's company and step by step mm-hmm. and suddenly it's this viable way to make money and she was sort of making that conversion from being so identified as Chrissy Snow, so identified as an actress, mm-hmm. and now it's kind of the last thing you say about her. Mm-hmm. You know, there's mm-hmm. there's writing, mm-hmm. there's a, a direct response, entrepreneur, uh, um, and then you get to actress usually. How do you explain, because what she has accomplished, just to go from that level of TV stardom to really being the, one of the biggest in the direct response world and the success she's had. What is it about her? I know I have some thoughts, but what do you think? I think it's adversity. I think that um, when you when you put a, a challenge in front of some people, they're either going to recoil and regroup, and other people are going to say, I got to get over this. I got to climb this wall. And uh, um, there's it's a million to one that she would come from this small town in Northern California and become... Chrissy Snow on what ended up being the number, number one. one. Yeah. What year is 70s? I 77 know. was yeah. the first year. Oh boy, I remember it well. And it was <laughs> five years. And then she had the contract dispute yeah. and it lasted a year after that. Mm-hmm. You know, they they, right. they didn't respect the chemistry between those three. Right. Uh, um, but a major depression, which I can understand and relate to, uh, that she went through when it was finished because uh, um, that's that's all she knew. Now what? And uh, um, the next stage was she sat down and this book started pouring out of her and she wrote her autobiography and became uh, um, uh, the, the face of adult children of alcoholics. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and then she went to Vegas. And a uh, funny story, I remember uh, I was there obviously opening night is a special thing. She was opening at the MGM Grand. And before she walks on, Bill Cosby calls her and says, Suzanne, good luck. 
And she goes, well, thank you, Bill. Like, she didn't know him. But, right. You know, right. maybe they bumped into each other at a party. And he said, uh, by the way, Suzanne, you don't have an act. And it ended there. And it sounds horrible. And it kind of is. But the reality is, is um, if you like, uh, you know, the book Outliers, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Um, it takes 10,000 hours to become proficient yeah. at something. Mm-hmm. She didn't have an act yet. So she has started these careers, become proficient at them, and then she climbs that wall and starts another career. And the reality is, is she's going back to Vegas uh, in a few months, uh, um, back to MGM Grand, wow. and she she has a four year deal there. So now, it, you know, it, it, she's obviously done that for many years, but it's uh, uh, something that she's more than comfortable and oh, and, of course. and a, a beautiful singer and. She's testing some of her dancing skills right now <laughs> of course. on Monday nights. <laughs> right. Oh, I was thrilled to see her on there. So, but, but what quality do you think she has that has made her so successful with direct response, talking to the camera, getting people to pick up the phone? She doesn't BS anyone. Her brand is sincerity. Mm-hmm. And I think that that sincerity comes from surviving. She had a crappy childhood, you know, growing up with an abusive uh, uh, alcoholic father is, mm-hmm. is not ideal. And um, coming out of that and figuring out how to make it in this business, which we both know it's a tough business. Mm-hmm. I my one of my daughters wants to cut and get into this business and I'm doing everything I can to use reverse psychology. And yeah. How Good terrible. Luck with that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, especially in this town. Yeah. Exactly. It's yeah. so, so attractive. Yeah. But I think uh, that survival instinct um, has forced her to constantly be honest. You know, when she mm-hmm. got when she basically got fired from three's company mm-hmm. rather than make up excuses. Eventually she realized I just need to come clean with that. Uh, um, then uh, she came clean in her autobiography. Then she got cancer. Then mm-hmm. she, you know, it's like all of these mm-hmm. things. And she just shares her um, her insights on her experiences. She's not telling people what to do or how to do it. She's saying, here's what I did. Here's what worked for me. Mm-hmm. If that helps you, I'm, I'm grateful. And uh, um, I think she takes that, you know, when, when she's looking at the camera, like sometimes I'll look at her because I, I uh, have directed most of her direct response spots. And sometimes I'll look at her and say, you know what, the, the, we call it the bullshit light. Yeah. The bullshit light went off a little uh-huh. bit. I, th- I think you have something more sincere. And she knows exactly what I mean. And it's usually because it's getting late and she's right. might just be a little tired. Right. It's not because she's trying to be insincere. So in the fact that you have di- been directing her yeah. quite often, how yeah. is that dynamic? Oh, it's so easy for the two of us. Oh, really? Because it's shorthand. Yeah. Like sometimes, uh, um, you know, sometimes I coddle new talent that I don't know. It's like, what's... <laughs> right here. He coddled yeah, me a yeah, lot. Yeah, well, you're, you're, being, you're being modest because you were a, were a pro. Those oh, were so kind. easy. Because okay. remember, I had big jib arm shots yeah, and everything yeah. and, <laughs> and demos that could have gone south and you were nailing it. But nice. uh, working with her, mm-hmm. it's uh, uh, sometimes I just look at her and say, let's do another one. And she knows exactly what that head nod means. So interesting. Yeah. The, the mother son yeah. dynamic. Okay, let's talk for a few minutes about Syncbox because yes. that's your company. Yes. Give us the philosophy of what you do over there. Syncbox is a creative agency. Um, it started because I wanted to be a filmmaker and I got out of film school and and got my, actually, my parents wouldn't hire me. Uh, um, I My first job was for LA Gear. Uh, uh, remember the old tennis shoes? Sure. And once they saw that, they said, okay, now we'll hire you. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, um, I started, uh, I always wanted to do like the prettiest Mm -hmm. spots I could, you know, Mm -hmm. hip and cool and funky. Filmmaker. Exactly. And uh, um, when I uh, jumped into direct response, my first spot was the second thigh master spot, like, Mm -hmm. you know, just the sort of brand extension. And uh, um, I went in that bent. And when I was getting these jobs, I had creative directors saying, you know, that's a great shot, but it's never going to make it in this spot. But sure enough, it started making it in spots, and we we attracted the attention of companies like Visa and mm-hmm. Microsoft and uh, uh, DirecTV, mm-hmm. and suddenly brand response was born. I I like to take credit for it. I don't. I think it was the zeitgeist of where um, that niche of advertising was going. Mm-hmm. We were just on that forward, you know, edge of the envelope. But the reality is, is uh, um, we discover and realize and keep uh, uh, keep testing this theory that branding and direct response selling mm-hmm. uh, are not diametrically opposed. They mm-hmm. can actually find a happy happy union, mm-hmm. so that when someone has a new product, they can release it 
And if they want it to, if they just want to make money and like get in and out, great, yell and sell, you know, mm-hmm. do something obnoxious, do something very disruptive. Mm-hmm. If they're trying to create a brand, if they're trying to create something that's going to end up in retail and have some legs and that people want and they want to talk about, which is part of what branding is, you have to, you have to think about that. You have to have um, the right, the right tone, look and feel. Mm-hmm. So that's what we do. And uh, that's your niche more than our anything. Niche. More, yeah. Right. And our clients are entrepreneurs to Fortune 100s. Mm-hmm. Um, and I always say our entrepreneurs benefit from the knowledge of process that we learn from Fortune 100s. Mm. But Fortune 100s learn from our entrepreneurial experience because they're not. Mm-hmm. Entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. and they don't—they're—they're they're very risk adverse. What advice would you give someone who has a product or has an idea? What would you say to them before they jumped in, or maybe they're in the middle of it now? The first thing I always say is gut check, because it's going to take so much longer, and it's going to require so much more equity, and and maybe not money, although it usually does, mm-hmm. but sweat equity. It just—it's a—it's constantly being turned down and denied. Uh, um, and if you have the stomach for it, then now you've passed phase one. Phase two is, is it really going to change my life, me the consumer? Mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. at the end of it, we always talk about the four pillars of direct response. You have to have problem solution. That's advertising. Okay. Uh, generally, especially for a new product, mm-hmm. testimonials. Because mm-hmm. if it's new to the world, they're not going to believe the voiceover from the sky that says this is fantastic. Right. Uh, um, demo, demonstration. Can mm-hmm. you demonstrate what it does? And that's really key. A lot of people, uh, when they jump into it, they don't realize that the, the close-up of the widget doing its thing is really important, more important than the pretty woman who might be holding it, if that's the direction they go. Right. But the last thing is uh, the offer. And uh, the offer really, if you put yourself in the consumer's frame of mind, they're sitting there consciously or subconsciously saying, what's in it for me? Yeah. And if it's time or convenience, great, then is it price driven? And it, it only has to be one of those, but sometimes it's all of those. Four pillars. Yeah, exactly. Those are good. So where do you see the direct response industry now versus the future? Because I know you're a future thinking yeah. guy. Well, it, I, I'm always trying to uh, anticipate the future. Yeah. Uh, um, the, the future is really being dictated by how uh, digital consumption and internet consumption is happening and now mobile. Mm-hmm. You know, while I was waiting here, I did something that I normally would do on my, on my computer or even my iPad. And now I'm having this uh, very fruitful experience on my phone. Uh, um, the reality is, is just five years ago, we would do a two minute and a one minute spot uh, for a client. Now, there's no way we would just do that. It's minimum five elements. You need a two minute and one minute, but they need to be tailored if they're going to be on your homepage, which everyone has. If, if you don't have a website, yeah. don't bother. Right, <laughs> right, right. Uh, uh, television is still the greatest medium for announcing yourself. It's biggest net, tallest mountain with the mm-hmm. biggest megaphone, but it's a, it's a terrible conversion tool. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, everyone's going to go online. Uh, uh, so you, you want to take those spots and make sure they're online, but you have to change the thinking. Now someone's on the site, so you're not trying to drive them to the site. Mm-hmm. So really what you want to do is retool that creative. But then there's the other spot that you want to put in, uh, on YouTube, buy some pre-roll, or 15-second spots that you can buy throughout uh, uh, publications on, online. And those are slightly different. It, like, let's say you're doing a, a yell and sell. Mm-hmm. Then um, a lot of people want to start with something kind of obnoxious or a problem or something. It's really, you have to imagine, most people are seeing those spots with the volume muted. Mm. So that's the time where one of the few times where branding trumps direct response in terms of best practices. Mm-hmm. You need those engaging visuals. And I'm not saying it needs to be the most expensive camera and the most beautiful lighting, but whatever those first few images are, it needs to be really engaging because usually three, six seconds, whatever format you buy, people are going to skip it. Bruce, I want to thank you for coming in. My this pleasure. This has been great. Yeah. And, and one of the nicest guys out there. I don't know how that <laughs> happened, but he's got a nice mom. So maybe that was – she did something right, Suzanne. Good job. Thumbs up. So I, I have Syncbox Media Syn- on the screen there. Uh, yes, yeah, Syncbox Media, yeah. syncbox.com. 
that that's how people can find you if they need to track you down for that niche exactly that brand exactly well i want to thank everybody for tuning in today if you're an inventor out there looking for more information you can go to my website thepitchwithtom.com if you're an investor or a marketer and you like one of the products you saw on today's show or on a previous episode just email me at tom at thepitchwithtom.com we will see you next time on the pitch to learn how to appear on The Pitch, go to thepitchwithtom.com. You can also view pitch segments there or at YouTube by searching The Pitch with Tom Jordan. But make sure to spell my name right. To contact one of the inventors or if you have any questions, email tom at thepitchwithtom.com. Today's episode sponsored by Revenue Solutions.